I again, Kenneth Scott Lateretta, History of Christianity, the Byzantine continuation is discussing the, the growth of Christianity among the tribes and divisions of Eastern Europe. Methodius and Cyril went to Rome in 868, thus acknowledging the authority of the See of Peter. This must have been balm to the soul of the Pope, then Hadrian II, as recogni recognition of his authority by Greek priests in his dispute for jurisdiction with the Patriarch of Constantinople. Yet the Pope wished to avoid giving unnecessary offense to the powerful Germans. He is said to have received the brothers cordially, to have given approval to the Slavonic service books, that is, they had been already translated in the, Slo the language of the Slavs, to have permitted the use of Slavonic in the Eucharist in some of the churches in Rome, and to have made arrangements for the ordination of several of the candidates for the priesthood who had come to Rome with the missionaries. Constantine died in Rome, February 14, 869. Heeding a last wish of his brother, Methodius continued the mission to the Slavs. Possibly at the request of one of the Slavic princes, the Pope revived an ancient bishopric in Illyricum and appointed Methodius to it, presumably welcoming this opportunity to strengthen, through a Greek, the jurisdiction which he claimed in that area. The Germans were offended. Methodius was tried and condemned by a synod of Germans and for two years and a half was confined in a German monastery. The Pope eventually obtained his release, rebuked two German bishops who were involved, and ordered his restoration to his see. Yet Rome compromised with the Germans, and Pope John the Eighth, who he and Pope John the Eighth, he who confirmed the reinstatement of Photius, ordered Methodius not to use Slavonic, perhaps in view of the needs of the mission in Bulgaria, John later relented and permitted Slavonic in the services of the church. John, in 879, he made Methodius archbishop and head of the hierarchy for the Moravians. Methodius is said to have visited Constantinople in 882 and to have been received cordially by Photius. Photius established in Constantinople a school for Slavon Slavonic studies. This became a refuge for Slavonic priests who had been sold into slavery by a hostile prince and had then been freed by Venetians and sent to Constantinople. Methodius died in 884 or 885. The course of the pupils of Methodius continued to be troubled. Probably at the instance of German clergy, Rome again withdrew its permission for the use of Slavonic. In the year 900, the pagan Magyars who crossed the Danube soon made themselves the masters of much of the area in which Constantine and Methodius had labored and Christianity suffered. Yet the work of translating Christian literature into Slavonic went on and contributed greatly to the spread and nourishment of the Christian faith in Bulgaria and after 950 in Russia. It was through the Byzantine wing of the Catholic Church that Christianity made its chief gains among the Serbs, the Emperor Heraclius reigned, who reigned from 640 to 641, whom we have already met in connection with the Monothelite controversy and the Persian and Arab invasions. He sent missionaries who baptized some of the Serbs. In the second half of the 9th century, Basil I attacked the Serbian pirates who were preying on commerce, swept them off the seas, laid waste their strongholds, and sending them priests compelled them to accept baptism. We've already had occasion to say something of the conversion of Bulgaria. That, however, is so important that it demands a more comprehensive statement. The Bulgars were a people of Asiatic origin and of Turkish or Hunnish stock. In the second half of the 7th century, they had made themselves masters of extensive territories north of Constantinople. They were so near that capital that they repeatedly threatened it, especially in those perilous decades when the Arabs were making great gains. They were a minority who ruled over a population which was predominantly Slav. As we have seen, the Kagan, or king of the Bulgars, Boris, was baptized in 864 or 865. Boris seems to have been considering that step for some time. One of the Carolingians, Louis the German, whom 
whom Boris had defeated, believed that he had persuaded him to receive the right. While the Bulgarian army was out of the country, assisting Louis, the Byzantine forces invaded the country, and Boris purchased peace by ceding some territory, promising to withdraw from his alliance with Louis, acknowledging the suzerainty of Michael III, and accepting baptism. Envoys of his were baptized in Constantinople, and a mission of Greek clergy sent by Photius went to Bulgaria and baptized the prince himself. This act of Boris precipitated a rebellion of the Bulgar aristocracy. It may be that Boris wished to use his new faith as a means towards introducing European civilization and of strengthening his own power as against that of the nobles. We shall see that happening in more than one kingdom in succeeding centuries. To this the nobles would quite understandably object. Boris put down the rebellion and furthered the instruction and baptism of his subjects. As we have noted, missionaries came from the Byzantine Empire, Greeks, Armenians, and Paulicians, and a mass conversion was seen in progress. Missionaries also entered from the West. More about Boris and the Bulgars next time. Put in a link to uh, what Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Watchtower Movement, said about how Christendom had already fulfilled Matthew 24, verse 14. See you next time.